n minus m, which are the non-basic or called non-basic variables. But if some, if some uh, components of the basic variables, if some of the basic variables happen to be zero, or zero, so in other words, you have more than n minus m components, then this is a degenerate, degenerate vertex or solution, feasible solution. Okay, and um, what can happen is that, let's see, when you, for instance, try to move to the next vertex, of course, you can always move to a vertex by picking, you know, how do you move to the next vertex? You have to go to, so to, move to the next vertex or solution, you set um, you know the new basic variables. In other words, you set some of the variables of xb, one of the variables of xb0 and then you, set, you, you figure out which one of the non-basic variables uh, from the previous step have to become non-zero, right? But you, you know, if you happen to pick the living variables to be exactly the one where which was already zero, that's a possibility, right? That so set by um, the new uh, basic variables by choosing the entering variables um, that's remember sort of setting the direction in which you were gonna you're going to move uh, and leaving variable, which is the which would be sort of the one direction you're going to pick in XB that has sort of the, the uh, the direction in which you can go to actually set those that variable to be zero, um, that was set to be uh, by um, looking at by comparing the ratios uh, of let's see what were those those were the inverse b so those are in the right hand side of the simplex tableau I think this was the versus the column of the um, the pivot column okay so that's that's uh, if you haven't if you can imagine that uh, simplex tableau once again Okay, and we said we pick this ratios to be the which ones the least positive one, right? Now it turns out that if you if you um, so so in general um, the simplex. Method allows for the uh, least pick 
the least non-negative ratio. In other words, if you if you always if you allow zero to be a, a ratio that he can pick. So in other words, if the right hand side happens to be zero in the simplex tableau for one variable, and you pick that as, as sort of the, the living variable, and then you do the pivot around that one, that's when you can get into cycling. Um, we, we, we normally don't do that. I mean, if you sort of say, no, I'm going to pick the least positive one, like we said, then you, when you pick a, a least positive one, what you're going to do is you're going to actually always advance, like increase or decrease the, the um, uh, objective function. But that still kind of leaves you when you are at the, so if one picks the uh, least positive ratio instead. Then you'll say, well, I'm always going to advance or decrease the, you know, get, get closer and closer to the optimal value. But when you are at the optimal value, you can, also, you can always, um, well, you can stop if you know it's an optimal value, or you can get to a degenerate, um, to an optimal vertex that is degenerate. And if it's degenerate, um, then you're going to get some of, of, the, uh, of the variables, you know, more, more than enough of the variables to be zero. So you could get into cycling even if you're at the optimal solution. Okay? But if you pick the least non-negative, if you allow zero to be the, the um, um, you know, possible pivot point, then you can actually get into cycling before you get to optimal value. And that was sort of the, that was the example there um, in the homework. No, no, you could divide by negative number, but, okay, so. I remember that somewhere, too. A non-negative number. Because when I, when I pick zero divided by minus one, it's You mean cycled. like this, right? Yes, yeah, so it's zero divided by minus one is what it turned out. Well, what I said is if, if you have zero in the pivot column, if you divide by zero, then you should ignore that. Right, yeah, right. That, yeah, that's pretty obvious. But okay, but if you have a negative here. You can always replace this by putting a minus across. So the sign of this doesn't really. Okay. Well, somewhere in there it said you, can't, you shouldn't divide by a negative number. I think it was in the book somewhere. But if you multiply by a negative one, it's not a negative it, it, number. True. But so why did they even say that? It had, maybe it was the fact that if the ratio is negative. Okay. Yeah. Of course, if the ratio is negative, you also ignore that. Because if you, when I pick zero, that column it cycles. It right? cycles. When I pick the other one, which was one, it was not answered. Yeah. So it, it's not like when you're in a. In, it's, it's, it's not the case that if you have degenerate vertices in that simplex, and it can be a complicated one, that you will kind of never be able to advance. The question is how do you actually force it to advance, right? So, um, and the, the algorithms are, you know, usually say, you know, pick the least positive one. But. Um, You know, in principle, you could say, well, um, I mean, you can see this degeneracy of those sort of sets of vertices um, to appear if you have some, some zero. Or what would be the previous tableau if, you know, if you get this one to be zero on the right-hand side, that kind of corresponds to the previous tableau with, a rate, uh, with two ratios that are equal. I think there was one case where you may have gotten in the... Uh, in an example before, where you know you do two ratios and they're but they're all positive, but they're they're equal. What does that uh, imply? You pick whichever one you want, right? 
then when you do the row, uh, the reduction, the row reduction. So, so maybe maybe I should put it like this. So if you have something that's this is the pivot column, and you have eight, four, two, one. You know, then the ratio would be the same. So which one do you pick as a pivot? Doesn't matter. I mean, you can pick either. Well, it it will matter. But if you pick sort of one, then the next tableau will contain a zero. Okay, because how do you do it? You just want to make, for instance, I don't know, may, maybe you want to pick this one. Let's, let's, it's easier. If you pick this one, and of course you're going to make this zero, so I'm going to make this zero. Multiply by negative four, right? So then, then the first one is going to be zero. Right? And here you're going to have zero, one, zero, zero. And this is going to be zero. So, when you have two ratios that are the same and some at some stage, so at some vertex, right? And this can happen. This means that the next vertex you move to is a degenerate uh, vertex. Okay. If the ratios are equal. If the ratios are equal. I'm sorry, two, two. They're equal, right? The ratios are equal. Sorry. Right. And let's say this is the least positive one. Then you're going to pick this, and the next one is going to be a degenerate case, right? And um, that's when it can get the, the algorithm to be cycle cycling. And again, this is this is a possibility if you have sort of a algorithm that is not doesn't doesn't pay attention to this um, to this criterion. Okay, and in reality, so when when do you sort of get this situation? When when the constraints are redundant. I mean, you can kind of imagine if you start with two constraints that are sort of identical, and that means it's redundant, right? But it doesn't have to be that they are identical. It, it it's enough to say that um, the set of first three constraints implies the fourth one. Then again, you have redundancy because you can ignore the fourth one. And anyway, the example was um, the example in the homework was this one. Well, the picture is probably more suggestive. X one plus X two less than one. X one less than 1 and x1, x2 positive. So it was, you know, one was this, and of course the other one was that x1 has to be at most 1. So this was redundant. Okay? And redundant kind of makes that point, if you write in the standard form, to be degenerate. This is the degenerate uh, solution. Why is it a degenerate solution? Well, it's characterized by x2 equals 0. And it also, this point satisfies both constraints with equality, right? So you get the slack variables to be zero. So you get more than, you know, two. Uh, you get a degenerate point. Well, in this case, uh, the si of course, the simplex tableau has no, I mean, will pretty much always reflect this point since you don't, uh, if you choose this, if you choose this, uh, this strategy of allowing zero to be one of the ratios, then you're going to get a cycling uh, tableau, I think, with cycle two. So you it sounds like your definition of over here, it just seems to be about in two or three dimensions. You've got a, a solution that's on axis. 
here. Yeah, but keep in mind this is this is for the standard, so this will be four dimensional actually here. So this this the 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 picture that you get in the physical space in the space of the only the x variables is not really connected with the feasible set of the in standard form. In standard form, you have a lot more variables, so it's all it's. You would have to draw the picture in, in four dimensions. Yes. So the picture here is, would be in R4, right? And I'm not going to be able to draw the feasible set in R4. But in R4, it's going to look like this, right? Because it's... it's um, uh, two-dimensional subspace of R4, right? Translated and then cut by the positive sort of cone. Well, these are the extreme points that I was talking about here, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to move from one vertex to another in this, you know, larger space. But if you have degeneracy and if you don't pick the uh, v kind of the strategy, you know, with this uh, positive, I'm sorry, with this positive ratio rather than with uh, allowing zero, then you may actually be moving like back and forth between two vertices in this higher dimensional space. Both these vertices will correspond in this case with ju just this one. So you don't move along on the actual simplex, but you do move. The simplex method, really, you should think about it as, as moving in this, uh, in the standard form. So you're moving along, you know, vertices in this in this uh, larger space. Okay. So if here this was. Um, what was this point? One, zero, 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 right? Well, I think this point was, well, same, same x1, x2, so same one, zero, right? But maybe some other value, one, zero, something like that, right? And then the next one is, Again, if you choose, you know, the, um, the pivot with a zero ratio, you may actually, you know, sometimes you don't, but you may actually uh, return back to that vertex, maybe after one step or maybe after five steps. Okay. And really, I think this is, this is a problem when you have a large simplex, a, a large linear programming problem. Uh, you may end up with, you know, a case where you, you never kind of get to an optimal value. Um, anyway, so that's Comment. Oh, this actually is finished. Intake. Okay. Let's see. Um, any questions? So far, I mean, I've. I know there there were some questions about this Hessian of um, that we're talking about here, where you have, you know, how do you actually check convexity? Um, and what I said is the convexity 
is reflected if you have a, if you have second derivatives is then reflected by uh, the Hessian the nature of the Hessian Yes, please. Um, I think in the book they talk about uh, it says if the Hessian is continuous, and uh, then you the conclusions. Are you saying that you see that all the functions that derives from this part? The second of the derivatives. Part, those the, are all continuous functions. Yeah. That's all they're um, So. Now, there, there are some subtle sort of. Um, um, I mean, these conditions that are that are uh, mentioned there. So, for instance, uh, the first one was that if uh, a function of you know several variables um, is twice differentiable, so you can differentiate it twice with respect to you know any combination of variables. And the Hessian, I mean, um, that's notation sometimes, is continuous. Then we said the condition f is convex is equivalent to saying that the Hessian at any x is semi-positive definite. What that basically says is, uh, and, and what's important for all x in the domain, so let's let's uh, let's remember k f is defined from k with real values and is convex if basically with every two points and t in the interval 0 1 we have what that f of intermediate point tx plus 1 minus ty less than or equal than t f of x plus 1 minus t f of y this simply says that you know, if you have the, if you can imagine the graph of the function, f. Of course, this is an R n, so the graph is actually an R n plus one. Right? Then uh, the value of the function at an intermediate point, uh, at a point in between x and y is sort of below the line segment uh, connecting those two points okay so it, of course the first assumption is that k the, the domain is convex because with every two points x and y you want to have the whole line segment between x and y in the domain. So you can talk about f evaluated these two things. Okay. Well, so the first statement which is uh, kind of connects the um, this, this concept of, of convexity with uh, the, what you know about uh, second derivative being positive in one dimension um, really requires that you have this derivatives, second derivatives, to be not only, you know, um, to exist, but also to be continuous 
in the domain on K. And again, the, this condition is sort of subtle. Um, well, it's, it basically wants to remove some of the cases um, where you may not have you may have some coordinates in the first derivative, uh, actually in the first derivative, yes. So if you have the first derivative and you have some um, it's probably d difficult to give an example. Second derivative would not be continuous if you have a jump, right? For instance, a jump in the second derivative. Um, So the first derivative would have some sort of a corner. Uh, what's an example like that? I guess in one dimension it's impossible to have that because Why is it impossible? So in one dimension, you don't need that, that condition. Why? Because in one dimension, it's just the second derivative, right? And semi-positive definitely means it's greater than or equal than 0. So you have the second derivative to be in, um, positive or 0. So in one dimension, This is equivalent with F convex, even if, for instance, second derivative is not defined. Well, not, not that it's not defined, but it's discontinuous at, at one point. And what's an example like that? How about just just uh, sort of well, it's a little bit of kind of a stretch, but if you just take the um, f of x equals the absolute value, then this is the graph. Well, but this doesn't even have, even have a first derivative. So, what's an example that has a second derivative? That has a first derivative but not a second derivative. I think it has to be. There are functions that have first derivative here, they match, but not the second derivative. I'm just kind of escaping here. Um, Make one half of that parabola downward. This one? Yeah. Just x squared and, and one half x squared. Or minus x squared. I guess that works. The first derivative is zero. 
right? But the second derivative is is um, is a discontinuity, right? But they're both positive. The second derivative is positive, right? In both cases, um, and the function is convex, right? Yeah. So that's that's that would be one example. Okay. Well, so um, how do we check semi-positive definite? Well, we do check that by. So again, um, a is pos is semi-positive definite. If Like we said last time, this is um, this expression a u and u transposed is uh, greater than or equal to zero for all you know directions in R n. In particular, this means that if lambda one, lambda n are the eigenvalues of a then um, A is, well, then this condition is equivalent to eigenvalues have to be greater than or equal to zero for all, for all, um, let me, let's just put it, lambda I equals, so all eigenvalues have to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and why is that? Um, well, first of all, imagine like you have an eigenvalue. What does it mean you have an eigenvalue? It comes with an eigenvector that is non-zero. You put that eigenvector in place of u, right? Um, and what comes out is so if, if u is xi is an eigenvector, of a corresponding to lambda i, then u transpose a u actually is going to be lambda i times xi transpose a, xi, excuse me. And what's the transpose of a vector times the vector it's itself? It's going to be a row times a column. is going to be the sum of the squares, right, of the component. So that's lambda i, if you'd like the, um, have you used this notation? So it's basically this, the length of that vector. The sum of the squares of the um, of the vector, and this is this thing is strictly positive since x is, is a non-zero vector, right? So when will this quantity be positive or zero? When lambda i is positive or zero, right? Non-negative. So if, if you have this condition of semi-positive definite, then lambda i, uh, the, all the eigenvalues have to be non-negative. And the, the converse is also true. If lambda i is not negative, then this quantity is, um, is non-negative on all, on all eigenvectors, right? Um, and if that's the case, then I, I think um, by the formula we had last time, so conversely, if lambda i is positive for all i, then you can get in uh, this by diagonalizing the matrix, I mean the matrix A.
and sort of rewriting this as vector v and v transposed gives you v transpose dv where d is the diagonal matrix of lambda 1, lambda n and this is positive by the same argument is. Uh, this is going to be a sum, summation of actually not a summation, it's going to be uh, one eigen, eigenvalue lambda 1 times the first component of v1 squared so let's, let me write it like this. So it's going to be lambda 1 v1 squared plus lambda 2 v2 squared plus lambda n vn squared. And of course, this is positive. Okay? Now, um, A is positive, semi, positive definite, not semi positive, just positive definite if this expression is strictly positive for non-zero vectors. Okay. And that corresponds to if lambda <coughs> 1, lambda n are the eigenvalues of A, then this means the lambda i is strictly positive. So what's the conclusion? If if at least if all eigenvalues are not negative, but one eigenvalue happens to be zero, then you have that it's not positive definite. Okay, so if um, at least if lambda i is positive or zero is not negative with at least one eigenvalue to be zero, then A is is only is semi positive definite but not positive definite. Sort of this, the picture is like I like I drew last time is um, let's say we're computing this the Hessian or the second derivative at one point at a critical point right the fact that it's this is a one dimensional picture of course but the fact that you have um, strictly positive that, that, that sort of uh, expression is strictly positive. It means, in this case, the second derivative is strictly positive. It means that this is, has to be a minimum, right? Whereas, If it's only semi-positive definite, then you may have the second derivative equal to zero. Right? Second derivative equal to zero means you have a linear function. Second derivative equal to zero, you have a line. Right? So you, you, this is only semi-positive definite. And if you're in several dimensions, You may have this picture on certain direction and this picture on other directions. In fact, the eigenvalues being zero will give you this picture, right? I mean, sort of a similar picture. Um, in directions where you have eigenvalue to be strictly positive, you have strict sort of um, unique minimum, only one minimum, right? Um, so. If n is greater than 1, uh, the following thing 
happen. So um, and u is a is a direction that we kind of single out. Then you can <coughs> consider the function to be x plus um, t times, well, not, not t, t is used for that kind of convex, s times um, s times u. And call that to be, you know, let's say a function f tilde of u, of s, excuse me. So you fix the point x where you want to compute the Hessian, or you want to decide the nature of the Hessian. And then you go in the direction of u. Okay. What happens when you take the first derivative? d by ds. You're going to get a gradient of f dotted with u, right? or just multiply. If, if you write this as a row, then it's just multiplication. If you take the second derivative, let's see how you get. Let's do that. So it's going to be, there's the gradient of x plus su times u. Okay. If you take the second derivative now, with respect to s, Basically, it's the derivative of this. How is it going to look like? This is now a row, right? It's a row vector. You differentiate with respect to s. So what I'd like to say is that this is the you transposed Hessian times u. Let's see, do I agree with this? So at s equals 0, which corresponds to the um, Hessian at this point, you basically have a second derivative to be u transposed Hessian at x and u, which is exactly the expression that we were looking at when we define some positive definiteness. Um, do, do you agree? With, do you agree with this? So, if you take the if you Take the, the derivative of a row vector and use the chain rule, then what do you get? Should we go through this? So let's fx1 x plus su times u1 plus fx. Well, let me just leave it like this. Just just the uh, the gradient. x plus su is this. fx2, x plus su. fxn, x plus sn, su. If I take the derivative with respect to s, Same thing that I did. Well, let me take the derivative with respect to s. Here you're going to have already n terms, right? Because it's a chain rule, so it's going to be 
the first derivative with respect to x1 and x2, the second derivative with respect to x1 and x, well, with respect to x1 and x1 times u1, right? Plus the second derivative of f with respect to x1, x2 times u2, and so forth. When you arrange that, you can see that it's actually easier if you arrange the u as a row and then you hit the Hessian um, along columns. Okay. So, one more chain, chain rule for each of these components will actually give you that, that expression. So, of course this is all screwed up, so I'm just going to open a new one. But, the point is, is that um, the Hessian being semi-positive definite for, for, uh, for all x makes the second derivative of those restrictions. So if you only consider the function restricted to, in a certain direction to have second derivative positive. So it's, it's so semi-positive definiteness really says that the second derivative of the function along all directions is not negative. Okay? And not at just one point, but at a, actually at, a, at all points. Okay, so it's enough to, um, so this, the fact that the second derivative is, is, is positive, semi-positive definite implies that you can simply, you can um, restrict uh, to one dimension. And of course, in, in, a, in, a, in a given direction, so in, in once uh, the direction u is fixed. Okay. So what one has to, uh, to say now is basically the fact that the second derivative is positive on um, some interval, why does that imply convexity, Con convex, in that direction? Meaning that f of tx plus 1 minus ty less than tf of x plus 1 minus tf of y. So really, simple, basically, it reduces to one dimension, just one function, function of one variable uh, with positive second derivative or non-negative second derivative on some interval. Why, why do we get this inequality? Of course, intuitively, it's Second derivative being positive implies that the first derivative is non-decreasing, right? First derivative non-decreasing. So what it means is if at some point is, let's say, has a negative slope, then as you move to the right, you're going to always get less Right? The derivative is going to be less, I mean, excuse me, uh, more and more. So it's going to increase or stay constant, but what is not going to, uh, to decrease. All right, so let's see, how do we conclude that that inequality has to happen? In other words, that given two points,
and a value and, and a point in between, the value of the function is below that line. So how do we right? Pick two points here, x and y. Whoops. Pick an x, pick an y here, and pick a point in between, right? We want to say that um, the value of the function at this point is below the line connecting those two points. It has to do with what's known as a mean value theorem, right? I mean, just heuristically, imagine that you would have, imagine that that's not, not the case. Imagine that uh, there would be a point here where the value of the function is above this line segment. Okay? Then what are you, what are you going to say? The mean value theorem gives you sort of a in between these two points, there is a intermediate point where the derivative is going to be same, slope. Second, same as, as this slope, right? So let, let me just draw kind of a proof by the picture here. Let's assume the contrary. Let's assume that the, the, the function would take this value above the line, right? Then this means that there's going to be a point in between where the derivative, sorry, would have to be parallel to this line, right? Well, the same here, there's going to be a point in between here where the slope has this value, right? Well, what's this contradiction? This slope is bigger than this slope, right? Because the slope is smaller if you so what you have on one hand you have that the slope is is increasing, right? Is non decreasing. On the other hand you have that the slope is strictly this slope is strictly bigger than this slope, right? So you've actually found two points where this property is not uh, satisfied, right? Okay, so once again, if uh, there were a t such that the f value of the function at this were strictly bigger than basically the point uh, the point on the line segment, then There exists, you know, like a um, z1 in the interval x and let's call this xt, xt, and z2 in the interval xty. So I'm assuming x less than y. Okay, I'd have a z1 here, and I'd have a z2 here, so that the slope. So that the derivative at z1 equals, and now it's just a matter of writing what is that slope. This happened in the past, and that's because my. Okay. So, sorry about that. So basically, that the derivative at z1 would equal this first slope. And how do we write this first slope? Well, there's a difference in f at this value and f at x. So it's f 
at x t minus f at x over x t minus x. Yeah? And f prime at z2 was equal to f of y minus f of x t over y minus x t. Okay? And of course z1 would be less than z2. But now look at <clears throat> but f prime at z1, let's say minus f prime at z2, we want to compare the two. We want to say that the first one is bigger than this one, right? If you take the difference and you do the computation, um, I mean, you just have to replace x of t with what it is, tx, tx plus 1 minus ty. I believe this ends up being As I said, from the picture, you can see that it's positive, and this, this corresponds to this assumption. So it would be exactly, <clears throat> it would be probably the numerator would be like the difference between those two, and the denominator would be the same. So you get that it's strictly positive, and that's a contradiction, right? With f prime non decreasing. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not, um, yeah, because Z1 is less than Z2. Is that true? The first one is bigger than the second one, yeah. Right, and that's, that's contradiction with the fact that Z1 is less than Z2. Okay, so the, Second derivative being positive, meaning the first derivative being non-decreasing, non um, corresponds to that condition. Okay. Uh, let's see. There is there is the converse. So converse, which says if f is convex and second derivative exists, then the second derivative is positive. Once again, um, that example with the parabola, one branch, like x squared, one branch, one half x squared, was an example where the second derivative didn't exist. But if it exists, then it has to be non-negative. And uh, let's see, I'm, that part is actually in the book. Um, what you have to show is that under these conditions, the first derivative is non-decreasing. Okay. So I don't want to um, go through that. The first part wasn't actually, I don't know why it's not actually uh, covered in the book, but Do you want me to go through this direction? I mean, the, the point is that <clears throat> the point is that you kind of uh, have a sense that convexity and second derivative being non-negative are equivalent, right? To prove it is sort of either. I mean, it kind of gets a little bit messy, but um, from the picture, like you saw before, it should be sort of uh, clear. The converse also from the picture, um, using mean value theorem, it act is actually also going to be um, intuitive. So I'll just I'll just point if if you want a precise kind of reason is uh, C textbook page ninety. Okay. Um, uh, 
Okay, so this is one, this is one condition, uh, one, one characterization of convexity is the Hessian to be semi-positive definite. Okay? And again, which translates that its second derivative is positive in all directions. And at all points, not just at one point. Um, and I think that first problem in the homework just um, is one, one situation like this, where you can take second derivatives. Um, being a quadratic function really is just constants. So you can, um, you can look at a matrix and show it's positive semi-definite. Um, the other condition is, as I um, listed it last time, it was that um, if f is uh, differentiable and the gradient is continuous, so again, it kind of um, leaves out some of some cases when the function is convex, but this condition is not is not satisfied. Um, say the, uh, like the, when the gradient is not like the v when the gradient is not defined at one point, or derivative is not defined at one point, uh, then f is convex is equivalent to that condition saying that f of y is that the graph is always above the tangent line about all tangent lines plus gradient of f at x y minus x So meaning that the graph of f is above all tangent uh, lines this of course this would be in a language of one d but in several dimensions is 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 the same. You replace tangent lines with tangent planes um, or tangent tangent spaces. Remember, we talked about tangent space. Um, and really, that condition is is, uh, is you know you don't have the wording here, but it's the same. So the, the value of the function f at any uh, point at any two points is in this relationship. Okay. Now, let me <clears throat> let me just say, going back to the uh, programming, to the you know nonlinear programming problems. So. to the nonlinear, to the convex um, optimization problems. So if we have, if you kind of are faced with minimizing a function subject to only inequality constraints. So I don't have equality constraints, just inequality constraints. And F and G are both convex. Okay? Then Any KKT solution 
and remind you what a, what a KKT solution is. If, if this is the optimization problem, then you set the system, the KKT condition, where you set the gradient of f plus some mu times the gradient of g equal to 0, and mu times g equal to 0. And mu is um, hmm? positive or equal to 0. So sum will be 0. And where it's not 0, the constraint has to be binding. Um, and you solve that. And you get one or more solutions, right? Well, any solution to that system is an optimal solution. To this optimization problem. Now, why why is that? So, let me remind you, KKT, as I said, is setting gradient of f plus mu gradient of g equal to zero, mu times g equal to zero, mu is positive, um, g is less than or equal to zero. Okay? So, um, If f is convex, it means that <clears throat> you have this condition that f of x is greater than f, f of y is greater than f of x plus the gradient of f at x times y minus x. And let's, let's say uh, x is a solution. Well, x with mu, x and mu is a solution. Then what what do you do? You you write this inequality for for that particular x, right? And now you use um, you know this relation to replace gradient of f, right? So you're going to replace gradient of f with so it's going to be f of x minus mu gradient of g times y minus x, right? because gradient of f is minus mu gradient of g. Well, now let's, um, let's write the same for uh, g. So g is convex implies what? That g of y minus g of x, well, g of y uh, greater than g of x plus gradient of g of x y minus x, so I want to solve for the. I want to write what the gradient of g is. Gradient of g at x y minus x is less than or equal than g of y minus g of x, right? So if I multiply by minus mu, then I get a greater than or equal than minus mu g of y minus g of x, and mu times g of x is 0. So this is minus mu g of y. Right? So remember, mu g of x is 0. So, <clears throat> so basically this quantity which appears in that first inequality for f is greater than or equal than minus mu g of y. Okay? So let's write that. So 
means that f of y is greater than or equal than f of x minus mu g of y and now what do we know about um, well feasible values for, for y are values where g is negative right less than or equal than zero so this is less than or equal than zero so this is greater than or equal than f of x so it means that f of y greater than f of x for all feasible y right so it means x is optimal So that's sort of the, I mean, intuitively is this, is this picture that if both f and g are, are convex, then the feasible region, which is g less than or equal than 0, is a convex set. And on that convex set, f, which is convex, is, has a minimum. I mean, it has that, that sort of shape. Um, and what's the, I mean, it could have several minima, right? If it has like a flat, you know, if it has the same value for f, you could have several minima, right? If it, uh, you know, like that picture that I had, it can be flat, right? Well, all the uh, solutions to that KKT, which were necessary conditions to have a, an optimal value, turn out to be sufficient, okay? So what it what this says is KKT is a sufficient condition. For optimality. So all solutions that you find for the KKT system will automatically be optimal solutions. You don't have to check anything else. You don't have to you don't have to do I don't know, any sort of a posteriori, I mean, like, uh, once you find, you think of those as critical points, then you study, you know, the nature of the critical points. Of course, that, uh, under the assumption that F and G is uh, convex. Okay? And the next question is, what if you have equality constraints? Okay, so um, what about, let me just say that and then take a break. So you minimize f subject to g less than or equal to 0 and h equal to 0. Well, the point, the, the <clears throat> the point, the problem with the equality constraints is that if you have an, a function that is not sort of a, a flat, like a linear function, so if this is not a linear constraint, if it's a convex constraint, so think about like x squared, it has to be, uh, well, x squared minus y has to be zero, so it would be a sort of a a parabola. You know, that's that's a convex set, but I'm sorry, it's not it's actually not a convex set. Um, right? A parabola is not a convex set. You take two points and the line segment doesn't stay in that set. I mean the functions involved are convex. The function H is convex, but when you when you set an equality you don't necessarily get a convex set. Whereas here you do when you have inequality constraint. When you have equality constraints, even if H is convex, this may not be convex set. Right? So the feasible set may not be a convex feasible uh, set. And then you have, you know, you have, it's, it's more difficult. So um, same conclusion, that is KKT is solutions 
are optimal holds when f and g are convex and h is linear linear now there's also a term affine 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 how do you say it affine, affine. Um, what's the what's the difference between the two i mean i don't know it's it's when you talk about a linear C1, well, A, let me use some sort of A1x1 plus ANXN. If you stop here, that would be a linear function, okay? If you have also a free term, which is sort of be the right hand side but put it on on this side then this is sort of called affine affine function right and the only difference is if you set this equal to zero because that would be sort of the constraint then what's the what's the uh, difference when you have this and you, when you don't have it uh, like a non-homogeneous term well the solution set would will be a subspace it will go through zero, whereas here it's a translate of a subspace. And a translate of a subspace is called an affine set subspace. Or an affine set, I think, yeah. So the only difference is, is, uh, is, is whether you have a homogeneous constraint or a non-homogeneous constraint. But it's still sort of the same picture. So that you have, this would be a, you know, AX, like I drew before, this would be AX equals B. It's a translate of the homogeneous. Okay? But either way, this is a convex set. Okay? So the whole point is that you want the, the uh, feasible set of your minimization problem to be convex. And by having this F to be affine, keeps it convex. Okay? And if that's the case, then you can you can actually replace inequality constraints with two inequality constraints, h negative, uh, h less than or equal to zero, and minus h less than or equal to zero. And then you can apply what what you uh, knew before, because both h and negative h are convex functions. Right. Think about this. How do you show that something like this is a convex function? You can do the second derivative. And you can get, well, yeah, you basically get this to be zero. Yeah, that's a good way. Second derivative is zero. So the, the Hessian is zero. Zero, zero, zero. That's a semi positive definite. I mean, that's a trivially semi positive definite, right? Everywhere. So that's a good. Or of course, you know, it's the same as saying, well, take uh, take two points just by the definition. Take two points x and y, and look at the value of h at a you know convex combination. I mean, you draw the line, and you would get actually equality rather than less than or equal than. But e equality means both h and negative h are convex. Okay, so. We're going to use this um, in applications. So, that in applications, what you have is you have, you know, given to you a minimization problem. What you need to to uh, check is, is this a convex situation? Are you in a convex? You know, do you have convex uh, objective function and do you have convex inequality constraints in a linear equality constraint? If if so, then you go ahead and you just do KKT. I mean, you can do KKT even before. But if you've checked those, then you know that the solutions that you get from the KKT system are optimal, period. If not, then you'd have to, to do some more analysis. Um, so 
you know, let's just take a 10 minute break and see a few examples.